Okay, well, good morning, um, everyone. I'd like, I'm Rachel Osira, District Rotary Foundation Chair for um, District 6450 and a member of the Rotary Club of Naperville. And I would like to um, welcome everybody this morning to our webinar, which is using community assessments to improve impact and sustainability of our global grants. So um, again, uh, I just wanna let everybody know that we are recording. So you know, please be advised that this session is, is being recorded. Um, we are in webinar mode. So all of our attendees other than our panelists are, are muted and are not visible, but we would like to ask you to please um, sign into the chat with your name, your uh, email, and your club, and then that way we'll be able to um, send any, you know, follow-up communications to you. And if you have um, questions or comments during the session, um, please put those into the Q&A. There's there's a Q&A as well as a chat, and we will be um, checking those uh, as we go. So I, I just want to re. Um, highlight what our goals are for the session today. You know, first is to understand the community assessments process and resources, to understand how community assessments can be used to improve our impact and sustainability of our, of our projects. And also, um, we, we think we'll have some time at the end to um, introduce the uh, Rotary Foundation cadre program and um, resource. Uh, some some really great information going forward. So I'd like to go ahead and um, begin by introducing our, our other um, panelists. And I'm going to turn it over to our district governor, Chuck <coughs> Corrigan, to introduce our guest speaker today. All right. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we have a really great opportunity this morning. Uh, <clears throat> as we know, Rotary opens opportunities for us this year. And uh, our opportunity this morning is to really hear from uh, the preeminent expert on uh, community assessments in, in respect to global grants and uh, other projects that we're working on in, through Rotary uh, with Wade Nomura. And we're uh, delighted to have him with us today. Uh, we also have our, uh, our own distinguished past district governor, Pedro Savalos Candao on the, on the call. And uh, Pedro is, uh, has our, our district's uh, uh, grants committee. Uh, part of our foundation uh, committee, and and we had a more meeting this morning. And uh, Pedro is uh, shepherding. Uh, what do we have open? I think 34 global grants uh, currently in our district. So we're very active, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity that Wade is going to be joining us and sharing his uh, knowledge. And uh, looking forward uh, to collaborating with uh, with the uh, cadre of technical advisors uh, on our projects going forward. Uh, Pedro served as our district governor a couple of years ago. I had the privilege of uh, working under him, and uh, I know he's a, a great gentleman, a, a very knowledgeable person with his background in engineering uh, and his distinguished career there. He brings great talent to our, our district, and uh, besides his good humor and uh, willing to just work with all of us, I really appreciate it. And Thank you, course, Rachel. Uh, Rachel introduced herself, uh, but... Uh, you know, she's been uh, our uh, district uh, Rotary Foundation coordinator for the last couple of years, second year, I think now, and and uh, before that, the grants coordinator and and really has brought uh, great discipline uh, to the program. And uh, we're lucky that uh, she has another uh, year after this to uh, finish that role. Um, <clears throat> you know, I could speak all morning on uh, Wade's uh, accomplishments in Rotary. Um, uh, he's done incredible things. Uh, you know, it, Often we see the leaders in Rotary uh, have uh, uh, some major accomplishments, but this man's uh, accomplishments go on for page after page. I, I, I don't want to uh, embarrass him by highlighting any in particular, but I do know that uh, he received the Rotary Service Above Self Award, which kind of encapsulates the fact that he has dedicated so much time and so much uh, effort uh, to what we all believe in its service above self. And, and congratulations, Wade, on that. And I know there are more honors coming your way down the road because you're just doing incredible work. Uh, a few years ago, Rotary uh, kind of reinvented our, our grants program. You know, it was a matching grants program called, and, uh, and then we went through a process called Future Vision. And uh, uh, really we kind of tried to identify how is this best going to work? 
and 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 Wade's been a big part of that process, and and really has uh, emphasized what we're going to talk about today, which is making sure that what we deliver into the hands of uh, the folks in the communities we're serving is what they really need and what they're going to support and what they're going to buy into, and it's going to be sustainable for the long term. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Wade being on here today, and and I don't want to take up too much more time uh, introducing, but uh, uh, Wade's a uh, Rotarian from California, and uh, Rachel and I and uh, Pedro have had the chance to talk with him, and we're we're excited that he's here today. Well, well, thank you very much, um, Governor Chuck. Those that that that's a wonderful welcome, and it really is important to um, share that context about um, Wade's Wade's background and. Our, our goals, um, you know, with the, with the global grants program and why this is so important today, and and I'm especially thankful that Wade is here because it's a I, I think it's a couple hours earlier in in California. So um, you know, thank you very much for for joining us this morning. We're going to go ahead and just um, jump right into the presentation in just a moment. So I'll be um, sharing and advancing those slides for Wade. So Wade, if I'm not if if you need me to to move forward, just you know, give me a, a verbal cue if I haven't. Will do. Will um, do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And thanks for doing that part of it. <laughs> yes, and and then we'll have some time for Q and A. Um, Pedro will be monitoring the chat, um, and, and then we'll we'll talk um, cadre at the end. So, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. And um, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that one. Uh, my name is Wade Nomura. As, as Chuck said, um, I am a part of the cadre program from the foundation. We are technical advisors that oversee and evaluate global grants of uh, any substantial size. Uh, one other bit of history, I did meet Pedro in Mexico. I was speaking in Mexico and uh, he was one of the other speakers at that time. So we go back a little ways. What's uh, nice about this one, as opposed to the one in Mexico, I did take some of my members with me from my district and it's funny i was speaking in spanish seeing them with headsets on having my presentation translated to english but uh definitely <laughs> enjoy doing it in english better so with that um we are going to be looking at community assessments and there was a misunderstanding i'd say when it was first came out that these community assessments were just another um, hurdle that we would have to jump over to make sure that our global grants were adequate quote by the foundation standards Ultimately, um, we realized that this community assessment became a major part of a global grant. Without a good community assessment, you will not have a good global grant. A lot of planning, um, hardships that you'll find out, things that you have to jump over, and also some of the assets that were involved with this all came out during a community assessment. Uh, next slide, please, Rachel. Oops. We go. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you. So um, kind of a picture, we look at the successes. Um, I've been fortunate to go on about 20 different evaluations of projects themselves. And I could tell you that all of the successful projects, literally all of them, all came in with very strong community assessments. Now realizing community assessments first came from um, needs assessments, but was changed into community assessments is an important concept too. Because in a needs assessment, we address specifically the needs. That's all we focus on is see if the need, in fact, is being met by the grant itself. In a community assessment, we not only look at the needs, but we look at the assets of what's available in each of these areas. That's why it's important to include pretty much each and every part of that one. Uh, these pictures are some of the pictures I've, I've taken from different project sites I've been to everywhere from Chile to, um, let's see, I was in Puerto Rico, uh, Honduras, Nicaragua, uh, Guatemala, Mexico. So these are some of the pictures of some of the sites I had the privilege of visiting for global grants. And by the way, as a cadre, I do have the privilege of seeing some outstanding grants that people outside of what I've done and been participant of get to see the successes of those. Next slide, please. Okay. We are looking at um, three factors. Uh, first of all, the partnerships, um, ownership and sustainability. Partnerships create the long term. In other words, we can't oftentimes look at by a club doing a global grant, being participant of that grant on a day-to-day -day basis. So partnerships become an important component to that. 
you'll also see now that Rotary and the Rotary Foundation are reaching out to different organizations, making sure that we have the adequate funding, knowledge, and know-how. So partnerships play an important role as we move forward with global grants. Ownership is another component to this one. Uh, back when we were doing matching grants back in the day, one thing we overlooked was the ownership of that one. We were so um, enthralled in trying to get projects done that oftentimes we forgot about the quote ownership of that one. The best project that you could do is a project when you walk away from, even though you did all the planning, all the funding and everything. And when you walk away, you hear the people saying, yeah, we did a great job. So it's all about we, the ownership comes from those people you benefit. It has to be theirs. It cannot be a gift. It has to have skin in the game. Ultimately, uh, we look at then sustainability. And this is pride of ownership. Sustainability will last a long time if there's pride within that community of what they received and they become part of that process. You also have to realize that, for example, in water, we had a lot of water projects go away. They go, went away only because people realize that, you know what, if it breaks, somebody will come back and fix it. Sustainability changes that one. Sustainability actually makes water an asset, an asset of a community. So there is um, a vested interest. All of a sudden now, it is a way of a future, a way of a better life. And that's how these projects should be sold, is that they have the ownership of what their future, of what that leads to. Next slide, please. Again, some examples. Um, these are pictures of some of the actual project sites. And you can see in these three photos, uh, the pride, the ownership of them showing off the projects that were done for them to benefit the lives in their, their community. Um, I did wanna point out one picture and the picture is uh, on your right side. This is a lady from uh, Guatemala. She is of Mayan Chorti descent. Uh, she's an indigenous person. And um, the project was to give them food. It was an agricultural project because of the fact they were so malnutrition. They did not have any major food source. They were poor enough to where they had to live literally off the land. The lady here you see, um, based on the hardship of her life, actually is about 42 years old, uh, 42 or 43. And the reason I knew that uh, she had an infant child that was a little bit less than two years old. So you can see how hard some of these, uh, these areas are. Next slide, please. So we look at community assessment tool. Now I brought this in here only because so many times people look at a community assessment, have an understanding of it, but they don't really look into um, what is needed for these community assessments. And so this guide is actually pretty effective. Uh, it works well. Some of the points I'm gonna be coming into next, talk about each of the phases of a community assessment. So next slide, please. We um, look at, first of all, the community uh, meetings, surveys, uh, interviews, and these six items. And I'm gonna jump into each one of these one at a time, showing the examples of what these are like, only because it, it takes a while. If you haven't done a community assessment, it's important to have understanding and a knowledge. So uh, next slide, please. Here we go. Uh, this is a community meeting. Each and every project has to have a community meeting. Uh, this is part of the community assessment and it's better to have it in person by somebody that is a host. That person comes from the area only because you have uh, language issues, you have cultural issues, you have a number of other things, uh, governmental issues that may affect the, the projects. And so by actually going in there with somebody that's from the area, there is a more comfortable uh, atmosphere created you get more canted uh, conversations that way. This picture, and I have a little bit of time I wanna share with you, was actually done in Guatemala also, high up in the mountains. Um, the project site was a school. We had a water project done there that was done about four years previous to that had, that had been completed. When I went up there, it took four and a half hours to get to the site. We were on dirt roads, we had rain, we had pretty much everything you could think of. When we got there, um, the people from the community, uh, about 100% of them actually, just about everybody was actually at this meeting. When I got there, they said, well, we've been all waiting for you. We've heard about you being a cadre and we wanted to make sure that you were welcomed in. So I said, well, thank you. Um, I walked to the front and as I walked forward, one of the gentlemen from the community actually grabbed me by the arm and said, please, you can't go in yet. You, know, you have to go inside the building because we have something there that we need you to take a look at. So I walked inside the, uh, the building there, which was the school and I saw about a half a dozen women working very hard at cooking. And I go, wow, what is all this for? They go, well, we're cooking a meal for the entire community and we're doing it in your honor. 
because uh, we saw that you were a of Asian, uh, an Asian, we wanted to make sure you felt at home. So we're here cooking uh, Chinese uh, chow mein for you. <laughs> I don't want to tell them I'm Japanese and that it's a little bit different cuisine, but uh, it was very touching. And this is the kind of reception that we get as Rotarians around the world. Uh, happy to do that. We walked in in the front and actually did our community meeting after that one, asking a lot of the questions. This is one area where you get a lot of people giving you good candid answers. Next slide, please. We do surveys also, and it's important to look at the surveys. Part of the work that I do previous to that is that we do a written survey. These written, written surveys are all pretty much standardized, and it gives you a good feel of what is going on by the individual people. But now you have to also realize a lot of these areas are indigenous or in a very poor remote area where education may not have been a factor for their, uh, their youth. And because of that, you also have to take a look at doing a verbal um, assessment or survey. And the reason for that, of course, is because sometimes the people that are illiterate will ask somebody to read that. As they read it, sometimes the reading just doesn't come across in the right direction. So it's important that we have a better understanding and get that information individually. So surveys play an important part of that one. Another factor that you should consider, and this is not part of the written community assessment um, chart. However, take a look at some of the other factors, the economics, the education, the health, jobs, all of the above. These all play an important key part. And I will show you some of the examples of things that may have been missed if we didn't delve in deeper beyond the specific need of those communities. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another picture. These are the interviews of some of the people that were actually in this community. This is in Honduras. Um, in this area here, we asked each of these people. Now, these people all represented part of a water committee. They had their responsibilities. They had their jobs. The gentleman that you see speaking to them is a Rotarian from the area. But the questions went beyond what they, their responsibilities were. We wanted to know if, in fact, they had an understanding of the implementation. Who was going to be responsible? what their specific responsibilities were and the secondary benefits, the first well, primary and secondary benefits of a project, which becomes an important part. As I said, sustainability only occurs if there's ownership and that ownership has to come from the people themselves. So that's why it's important that we do face-to-face -face interviews with each and every one of those people. There's another one that was interesting. Uh, I went to a project in um, just over the border in Mexico, a um, city called Matamoros. And in this area, they said that in the paperwork, 100% of the community had been given water. And it was all piped into each and every one of the homes. And when I went there to do the interviews, I asked them, I says, well, you know, let's go through and find out. So as we did a check off of all the communities and all the people that lived in this community, we were checking off 100% of the people. However, as you walk down the streets, I go, well, how about that house over there? It's a little bit off the beaten path. Oh, that one's not included because they have water. They purchased the water. Okay, well, how about that house over there? Oh, they opted out. They didn't want to pay the tariff for it. They may do that later on. Well, how about that one? Well, we never reached those people. We felt that uh, if they wanted water, they would come out and reach out to us. Well, now you find the flaws of some of these assessments. And so that's why it's important to do actual visual and in-person interviews. Next slide, please. We talk about focus groups. Uh, focus groups specific are those areas uh, or people and groups that will have the influence of what changes are gonna occur in each of these communities. You see the people dressed here in the different shirts of the gentlemen here, they are all part of World Vision. We partnered with them in this project here. Each of them represent one of the communities. They live in the community and they are part of an ambassadorship. Well, we ask them what's going on. They bring to us the information. So as focus groups, we can go to a group meeting like this and find out in fact, if in fact there's working, if there's shortfalls in the planning process or in the implementation. So this is where focus groups become an important component of that one. Next slide, please. Um, assets inventory. Uh, again, this is the different from a needs assessment. On assets inventory, we find out what is available in each of these communities. Oftentimes we see um, a lack of water we don't know where the water is coming from. Uh, if we do an asset, we find out that it may be groundwater, it may be a spring, it may be water coming in from a nearby community that was given to them by a church organization, another nonprofit organization. We see if there's an education component to that one, if there's somebody 
in the area that is educating the community or that could educate the community on some of the uh, continued education for the specific grant objectives. So this is where assets inventory uh, is a major change from that one. Next slide, please. I talked about some of the um, secondary uh, effects uh, and some of the secondary components that we should look at when we do community assessments. This is a photo taken right down the hill from the uh, Mayan Chorti village. Uh, I showed you the picture of the lady that was very happy with the agricultural project that she was given by one of the Canadian uh, clubs. However, in evaluating that, they said, well, 85% of the people were malnutrition and literally um, they were stunted both physically and um, developmentally about 80%. And because of that, this is where the agricultural project became important. What they failed to uh, identify was the water source. And the picture here shows the actual water source of eight different families that live in this village. As you can see, the girl here had just bathed her little brother. She was washing the clothes. Once she was done with that, she would scoop up the water and take the water back to the house for consumption. So this is one of the places where had they done an adequate, or I would say beyond adequate uh, community assessment, they would have found that water was the major component or one of the major issues that was leading to malnutrition. So um, one of the things that you want to take a look at. Next slide, please. One of the other points uh, I also wanted to bring up, again, uh, since I'm a specialist in water and sanitation and also in uh, community economic development, this again was a water project. Um, this group of people here, these women are um, Purapecha. They're indigenous people from central Mexico. In the village I went and visited, they um, was, a, was a water project that was identified as having a substantial need for water. And I asked them, first of all, um, what do you think about a water project? The first answer was, we don't need water. I go, well, you have water, but it shows that it's grossly contaminated, that it's polluted, that you're getting sick from the water. And they said, well, that is true. However, we've had regular filtered water. We do not like the taste of water, of filtered water. Actually, that water, uh, treated water, got us all sick, sicker than the water we're drinking now. So no, thank you. What we do need is some insulin because um, most of us, uh, close to was it 25, 30% of the community was suffering from diabetes. I said, well, we could look into that, but I think one of the primary challenges you're gonna face is that you know, we wanna try and get to water first. This is the basis for um, being able to improve your life standards. They said, well, um, why don't you uh, go back and rethink this out because we do want the insulin first. I asked them if I could see what had happened. 20 years ago, they had a water system put in is what I found out. I went to the site where they actually had this water filtration system put in and I saw it was a chlorine injection system. Went up to a tank and then was distributed down throughout the community. Well, when I looked at the settings on this thing, it was set at a hundred times the dosage of chlorine. So these people were literally drinking raw chlorine in the water. That's where the funny smell came from. That's where the bad taste came from. And that's why they were getting sick. So I told them that the new system would be completely different from this one here. Give us a chance in that. I will address the um, diabetic rate and see if in fact we could reach out to the community um, medical system and get some insulin for them, which we were also successful in doing. Once this project went in though, surprisingly, we found that the diabetic rate actually also dropped. And the reason for that was these people here were living off of soda, punch, and candy. That's the, all they could afford. They could not afford literally um, water because it was four times more the, the cost of water versus uh, a soda. So um, when we put the water into them, the diabetic rate had dropped to about half and we found out, wow, that was something else. Had we not done a baseline study of that one, we would have missed that component completely. Next slide, please. Some of the community mappings um, is an important component of that also. Um, oftentimes we kind of skip over this, we do a rough community mapping, but we don't look in depth into actually seeing what's there, what is available. This picture here was uh, done in Guatemala. It was a project I, site I went to where they were putting in water, uh, a water well that would service this community. I went in and we found that the water had been contaminated because of all of the agriculture in, in the area. It actually had contaminated the groundwater. It was a sugarcane area, huge farms were there. And what had happened is all of these uh, fertilizers and insecticides had leached down into the water, water table. So um, we identified this, 
we went back to the um, farmers, or actually the agricultural company, the corporation that was farming there, and we identified them and showed them the problem. That company actually said, well, we need the people in this community to help us out with our farming and agriculture, so we will dig another well. And they actually literally came in, purchased and bought all the equipment, including the installation of a new well that went down about 700 feet to a secondary aquifer. So um, that was done by the agricultural company itself. Rotary didn't have to put a penny, penny up and the identification of this need was met by the community uh, itself and some of the local government people that we're talking about. So again, community mapping is an important component of that one. The next slide, please. This will actually show you um, a very elaborate, uh, in my opinion, one of the state-of-the-art mapping systems. I'm a member of Handwash. Uh, this is Haiti Water uh, Systems. We're bringing, well, our mission is to bring water to the entire country of Haiti. It's going to be between 12 and 25 years project. It's going to cost in the billions of dollars, but this is the initial start that we have. The picture you see here is a map out being done of all of the water sources, identifying each of the sources itself, the shortfalls and the success factors, so we could identify our best, cheapest way to um, give water to each of these different communities. Next slide, please. And how do we map that? We actually use a smartphone, use the GPS um, application in there and punch in what we have there. And this is done through um, a cooperating uh, organization called MWater. And through that, we come up with this type of mapping. This is the entire uh, country of Haiti is now being done. We are about 60% done of all of the mapping in this specific area of Haiti. So now with this, we can then identify, is it just a broken pipe we have to fix? Is it a new well? Or do we have to seek new water sources for each of these communities? And this makes it easier for us to fund finance and identify who could do what in each of these areas. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like when we get into a specific commune or community. It shows exactly what we have, what we could address, where our sources are, our challenges, and the benefits, um, the assets of each of these groups. So um, that is a, a very elaborate way of, of doing community mapping. However, the better you do, the better the sustainability of each of these projects become. Next slide, please. I put this up here and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because as many of you have talked about uh, community assessment, I have seen probably only about 50% or less of those of you doing global grants actually looked at what it is. And this is the application for a community assessment and the results of that one. So I'm going to go real briefly. And the reason I'm doing this, so you aren't intimidated when you actually have to do and write a community assessment. So next slide, please. Some of the things that you see on the slide are, are pretty straightforward. It tells you exactly what we're looking for. Some of the um, lines could be filled with a brief one, two line statement. Others could actually be inputted with a complete report. It's better to have more than less. And again, the reason for that one is you wanna create the baseline. You have to have an understanding for this. Also realize that what comes up and is written into this community assessment is something that you will use as a buy-in component for sustainability. So you identify those people, you identify the groups, all of the above on who the partners are gonna be. Next slide, please. Again, uh, the same thing. You look at the, um, as you can see in the middle of that one, we went over each and every one of these specific components, how they were met, how they were addressed. Next slide. And uh, again, some of the points that we want to have. Um, again, this is an important component because, um, by the way, I did have to break this down. It's only about a two or three pager. But as you start filling this out, you get a better understanding of the community itself. And this is important for the club. I have seen some of these where they were done very briefly um, and they were kept, not shared by different groups of the club. And when a person went away, that was the primary of that global grant it was difficult in reassessing that one. So these community assessments need to be shared by a committee or by the club itself. Next slide. Again, some more of the components. This is the final portion of that. Well, you can see what, what the um, importance is in each and every one of these line items. It's pretty straightforward. 
they are different enough to where you wouldn't replicate a lot of the inputs into each of these cells, but uh, sometimes you do. Next slide. I'm going to take you through. Uh, this is what we as Rorty Foundation cadres do. Uh, as a cadre, um, I am a technical advisor. I carry another role, which is a little bit higher than that, where I oversee all of the cadres in water and sanitation. This is a photo of a place in Honduras where there was a water project done. This was done four years prior to me coming in for the assessment. I was sent in by the Board of Trustees to evaluate if in fact the sustainability component of this water project was sufficient, was successful, or whether we needed to tweak on it. You can see the picture. This is inside a home of a gentleman that was one of the um, leads in the water project itself. His house, uh, he invited us in for um, a meal. You can see in the background, his wife is working on an eco stove. You can look at the ceiling portion of the house itself and see how blackened it was, knowing that that was caused by an open fire from previously. So the eco stove now means that they use less wood to cook with. It controls and contains all of the smoke that is then exhausted out um, beyond the building itself. You'll see the floor is concrete. Sometimes you come to dirt floors, but this one here is concreted in. It was swept clean, mopped. Um, I saw a mop as I walked in. Um, you could see that the food being prepared was all fresh. Most of it was uh, organic, grown there in the area. Had a tablecloth, all separated out with clean dishes. Um, there's a wash station for the dishes. There was a wash station for your hands. There's silverware, so if people weren't eating by hand. In the back, you will see in the ground, an ice chest. So we knew that the food was being controlled, contained, and uh, there was a source someplace for keeping food cool. There's a wash station, um, again, and clean water. It was in that container with a lid on it, making sure that no contaminations came in while people were moving about. And uh, these, each and every one of these components became an important part of that one. I identified each food source as something that was not purchased, but it was grown by somebody within the village itself. Um, this becomes part of the success factor. We know for a fact now that education was retained, that the culture and the practices of each of these community members, this uh, house specific, was uh, retained for four years, at least four years since the educational component of that was initiated. So we consider this one one of the great successes. I was also very um, curious to find out, in fact, how this was done because my job not only was to make sure that this was all done adequately correctly, but uh, I had to eat the food. So I wanted to make sure that that food was uh, handled correctly, which it was as an outstanding meal. My last slide comes into this one. Um, I'm opened up for questions. Now I want to make this fairly short to make sure we had a lot of time to discuss. Pedro will also have a lot of uh, different practical applications that he has. But my role uh, with the Rotary Foundation um, I am an international technical coordinator of cadres of uh, water and sanitation and hygiene. So um, I oversee 107 members of water and sanitation uh, cadres around the world. That is an international position. Um, I also serve on the long-term planning committee. There are five of us. Uh, we started this three years ago. The long-term uh, planning committee is now looking at and implementing multiple changes that we see within the cadre of technical um, advisor program. There are 700 of us uh, members of the um, cadre and of the 700, we are in seven different areas of focus now, including uh, sustainability of the environment. There is one other one um, that is financial oversight. So as uh, technical coordinators, we actually have eight different components that we take a look at when we evaluate global grants. The long-term changes that you'll see, there are 700 cadres around the world. Of those, only about 60 to 110 were actually being called out on assignment. The rest of them just sat idle. So the new program now is implementing a plan where each and every cadre member will become a resource for clubs and communities in their geographic region. This was also broken up most recently by uh, a regional organization where I chair the uh, Regional Organization of North America, South America, and Central America, English-speaking countries. So we are now coordinating this through seven different components or areas, regions of the world. So that pretty much concludes this portion of the, uh, of the PowerPoint.
So uh, I am now going to open this up for questions and see if there's anything else that anybody else uh, would like to hear and understand about it. And again, I've enjoyed this one. In my opinion, doing a community assessment is something uh, invaluable. And it's part of the partnerships and the benefits you as Rotarians will have when you work internationally. A oh, real quick story. Um, I would like to point out how important this is being an international organization. On one of the project sites I went to in Honduras, um, I was invited at the end to um, a special event. In other words, I was packing up. I worked three days. I slept two hours a night trying to get these three different projects um, evaluated to try and save the foundation some money. On the last night, I was packing up. And I had to leave at four in the morning to the airport. A gentleman came to me and goes, well, what do you have for plans tonight? I go, well, I'm going to be packing. <laughs> I've been here for three days. I got to put everything together. I got to be in a taxi to the airport at four in the morning. He uh, said, would you like to go with me to a, a dinner with my wife? I'd like to introduce you to my family, which I was happy to do. So I went with him to, uh, to dinner shortly after that. He goes, I'd like you to meet the rest of my family. Would you mind coming to my home? So I went to his home and there was a big party going on in his backyard. I walked in and everybody cheered to go, well, you know, you are the guest of honor for this event. Thank you very much. So I walked in, he sat me at a head table with his daughter um, and her husband. I go, what's the special occasion for? This can't be really just for me. A lot of the people here aren't Rotarians. You go, well, it was twofold. You are a guest of honor because you come all the way from Evanston. And he thought I was coming from Chicago, which I wasn't, but um, I thanked him. I, I did represent the foundation on these evaluations. But he told me, he goes, well, actually, it's the reception uh, for my daughter. She just got married today, but you are still the guest of honor. I couldn't believe that that was the case. But this is the hospitality. This is Rotary. This is Rotary International. This is when we talk about a family, that we talk about a family that truly is international. We are all treated very well and as part of a family when we go internationally. So if you haven't done an international project, you haven't had the opportunity to travel, I suggest you do so because you'll be surprised how close we as Rotarians are similar around the world. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much, Wade. Um, what a wonderful um, presentation and uh, just so many really, really rich insights uh, about the projects. I, the photos, I felt like I was there. I, you know, I, I, I felt like I was with you. Um, and, and the people and uh, um, just, 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 just wonderful. I, I know um, Pedro's been looking at the chat and we have a, a question, a couple of questions in the Q and A and Pedro, I'm going to turn it over to you yeah. um, and ask you to um, reflect those questions and other questions, you know, that you've been thinking about and, and Chuck, you know, you're very welcome to do that as well. Yeah, I've got a couple, but uh, Roger has a couple nice ones in the Q and A. So maybe uh, we'll start with that, Pedro. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, uh, just a reminder to everybody, any questions that you, that you want to ask, please uh, put it in the Q&A and uh, we will pass those to, uh, to, to Wade. Uh, we have uh, uh, two questions that come from uh, Roger Hill from the Naperville Club. And uh, it's um, uh, re regarding at, one, at what point should uh, a person or a group that, or a club that is uh, working a grant Get the uh, get the uh, cadre uh, involved. I mean, can can this that's a very very good question. Prior, yeah, prior permission or or during the during the process. Cadres right now are established and set up to where um, well originally they used to be the evaluators of projects anywhere from a written assessment of what it looks like for an application all the way through to beyond the sustainability anything in between that one. The new component of cadres now includes grant planning. And it's an important thing to realize that as clubs come in and they may lack some experience, some of them are great, some of them are less experienced. It may be even be your first project that you get involved, a cadre involved with it right away. There's two reasons for that one. They bring the expertise of what you have to look for. They will literally actually assist you in writing these grants out, including the community assessment. One of the other benefits, and this is something brand new that we in the long-term planning committee have come up with, is that we will also be able to now connect you with cadres on the host end. And so you will have a team working not only here with you in writing the grant, but also in developing it at the host side. So you have another set of eyes 
somebody that is understanding of the community, of the culture, and of the governmental regulations at the other side also where the project is actually being done. One of the best things to do. Why? Because this is a, in addition to sustainability. We know it'll be successful because there's people there. You don't have to go as a club member now. All you have to do is connect with the other club that's doing the other end of it. Um, we just a, a follow up on that. Uh, how do how do people how do we people connect with Cadre? Is there like a um, a one eight hundred number that they call, or is, uh, is close? Actually, the, the easiest way to do it, um, you could email. It's Cadre at Rotary dot org. Hmm. That's wow. Yeah, uh, you can go on the website and do it also. You can see what they have on the uh, international website, but um, I'm giving you the uh, email to my boss, <laughs> Kadri at rotary.org. Oh, okay. <laughs> You'll get it right away. <laughs> oh, okay. So, and then it will be, uh, okay. So, so um, I know that we have, uh, we, we have uh, uh, people in our district that have all kinds of technical expertise and uh, they, they have worked in, in many uh, projects. Um, is there a process or a procedure? How do, how do they get involved with cadre? Is there, is, is, is there like a qualification process or? or yeah, there, a there is a qualification process. Um, if you are interested in becoming a cadre, first of all, one of the, um, I would say most recently implemented requirements is that you be educated. You have an education in the field that you're, uh, you're looking at. Uh, for example, at water sanitation and hygiene, my professional background is a landscape contractor, um, but I have a degree in horticulture, which includes microbiology, chemistry, all of the above. So uh, that would gave, what gave me the uh, qualifications to be in that one. Some uh, other ones uh, have less, um, I would say, professional background and expertise. However, if you look at a rotary grant and you look at this, the required having to fit within seven areas of focus in writing that grant, most cadres could fit in any of those one, one of those seven areas. As an example, I've got a water and sanitation cadre that came into me because he is an accountant. So financial oversight, he fit into. He signed up for that one. We flipped him then into water and sanitation. So that's how he could do it. If you're interested in that one, I would suggest you go to the, um, the Rotary Foundation website, look up um, technical coordinators, cadres, uh, uh, technical advisors, I'm sorry and it'll give you a direction for that one. We do have certification where you have to pass um, certification test exam, which is pretty easy. You could fly through that one pretty fast, but it is nine and 10 parts. So it takes a little while to do. Um, and again, if you still are interested and it's too hard to find, you can go to cadre at rotary.org. <laughs> and you can find it. Yeah. Pedro, could I uh, throw in a couple of questions for Wade? Yes. Thanks. Seth. Uh, Wade, uh, I'm going to pose a couple very common uh, situations that our clubs find themselves in when they're looking at global grants. Uh, first would be where they're approached by somebody, for, they have a connection with somebody overseas and they say, hey, we have a, a need here, you know, whether it be a water well or medical equipment, whatever that it may be. And, uh, and, and to us, it's, it's an obvious need. Um, and uh, it seems to the to the clubs that we have to do this community needs assessment to kind of backfill a justification um, where we already know what the answer is going to be. We need this, whatever it might be. And and how do we address that, the right approach to that, where we're like, okay, well, it's not just a hurdle uh, that we have to do to get what we want to do done, but how do we uh, really buy into that? You know, uh, one of the big advantages we have during the pandemic right now is that we have the Zoom that we go our meeting on. Otherwise, I'd be there in person sitting in front of an audience. The same thing is true with community assessments. As we move forward with this one, we can now Zoom in. We can actually talk to those people at the host level, do it both ways. Um, and again, it's important for each global grant writer to realize that doing the community assessment is the buy-in. That's your partnership. The shortfalls will show up along with the benefits, the beneficiaries, the partners, all of those will then fall into place once you start doing the community needs assessment. So it's an important part of the planning process itself and for the sustainability and success of your global grant. So my suggestion is reach out, find out if in fact they are responsive because I've seen some that come, they do an excellent job. They will sell the project to a club and the club is out. Uh, we are 100% involved with that one, can't believe what a great guy this one is. He calls back, he asks for things, he gives us information. 
all of a sudden when they jump into it, the guy's gone. Now what do you do? The guy just left Rotary because he had a fight. The club didn't know that he was doing this grant. He did not know that he had committed the club for the follow-up of all the work that had to be done. This is where community assessment is important. You see the partners, you identify with them, put them up on a Zoom meeting and you will see the faces of those. And I'll guarantee you, if it's just one person, you better ask for the committee. Yeah, that's you know, and, point. I, and I also heard from you know the presentation, the stories that Wade told us, um, you know, these examples where once you, you start getting into root causes and asking questions, the actual need or the actual issue is, you know, something different than it might appear. And, and there can be situations too, where, you know, something that, you know, we might think is a way to do things um, in that community and that culture is not the way. To, to do things. Um, so it's so important that the community assessment be seen as an asset itself and a tool, not, not a hurdle, check the box. Um, and, and this is the thing that, you know, for the last couple of years, since it's been required, you know, that we've really been trying to um, have people embrace. And, and that's why, you know, this is such a powerful um, set of learning, you know, today and, and going forward. Um, back to you, Chuck. Yeah, just uh, the second part is uh, the other thing that's common in our district is that uh, we're looking to do global grants here in the Chicago area. And uh, Pedro really championed this when he was a district governor. And and uh, how would you, you know, we the examples you went through were, were typical overseas projects, uh, you know, and and how would you address it in an urban area like Chicago? How, how would you go about finding out a needs assessment here? Exactly the same way. Um, you actually, instead of being the host, now you, you become the, you know, you actually, you become the host instead of the international partner. So you base it on the need. You find the need that you want to address as a club. Take a look at that and you go through the same thing. You literally could use the same exact community assessment tool. I've told people in district grants, do the same thing. Use the community assessments because even though you're comfortable, it's your home, it's your community, you will identify specific strongholds, the, the assets within that group. You also find out that possibly there's somebody else already addressing that need that you could partner up with. And again, one of the important things, if we are to expand the footprint, the outreach and the impacts of Rotary, we have to see who those partners are, partner with them. A way the um, we, we have a we have a question from Robert uh, Billard, and uh, his question is uh, how are the expenses, the travel expenses, paid uh, when you go in an international uh, fact finding mission like that? Are those paid by the foundation or are those paid by the club? As, as a Rotary Foundation cadre, our expenses are covered. Um, we have travel expenses, and we have a per diem that we were given based on the. Um, economics or economy of the country that we're going to. Um, it is, um, I, would, I would say comfortable. Uh, in other words, I do get my travel. The Rotary Foundation picks that up through um, RITS, Rotary International Travel Services. And then once I'm on ground, they send me a per diem, whatever is left over, I send back. Oftentimes, uh, and Pedro, this is some good information for you, and maybe you too, Chuck. When I do go, being a past governor, just about every meal is picked up for me. Um, the club will always have somebody there to meet me, greet me. Uh, we will have club meetings. And so very little of that money is, is, is spent. So that money all goes back to the foundation, which is a, a huge benefit. I have had other cadres that are a little, I, I would say more focused on being the uh, evaluator. And because of that, when they come across as the as the police, <laughs> the Rotary police. And they usually end up spending more money because of the fact that, you know what, they haven't connected with the clubs. They don't understand Rotary as a family. So yeah. I think that's a big one. There is one other point I'd like to make real quick before, uh, before it leaves my mind here. When you do a community assessment, um, I was talking international. As an example, you wanna do an educational component and this educational global grant has a good strong focus on benefiting them. If you look at the water needs, as an example, just as an example, what happens if they don't have the water? How could you address education if half of the kids aren't going to school because they're sick? 
if half of the kids aren't going to school because their parents are staying home from work to take care of a sick child. So take a look at that. It's important to see not only just focusing on the actual project specific, but see if there are any other factors that are gonna affect the outcomes of that one. Otherwise you won't have that success. It, it mm -hmm. becomes a limited number. Thanks. Just a follow up question, Wade. Is there a, I, I thought I might be wrong that, that uh, in order to get a cadre visit, a project has to be a certain amount of money and up? Or... This is correct. Uh, and we are usually assigned. We, we are assigned to that one. I've been asked to be on five, five different uh, cadre assignments, not officially appointed by the foundation. In those cases, I was usually funded by either the club or the district to go and do the evaluation itself, which I'm happy to do, which any cadres are. How are we doing it now? Um, I just worked with a cadre that's doing a, an evaluation in Nepal. Of course, we can't travel right now, so how do we do that? We organized videos, we organized um, photographs, we asked for specific documentation of the project, which we would be looking at if we were there in person, and we have that brought back. We also could now implement cadres from Nepal to actually go in there and confirm and affirm that what the pictures were are actually on site. So it makes it pretty easy for us. That's how we're doing it now. Are we gonna be traveling in the future? Possibly, but probably not that much. I think we're gonna see more of the cadres on the ground doing a lot of the work. The other way that we save money, um, the question was about travel. There was one trip I spent five days on. I went to El Salvador, I went to um, Ecuador, I went to Argentina, I went to Chile for two different projects and I came home, it took six days to do and I covered all of those projects. So <laughs> they, they bounce you around. If you wanna squeeze it in and save the foundation money, that's how we do it. <laughs> of course they yeah, slept we, the next uh, few days. <laughs> Wade, you mentioned uh, seven areas of focus. So that, uh, that hints at uh, the coming of the environmental area. Um, what do you what is the what are you doing to get prepared for that coming online and and what should we know about uh, uh, starting to plan environmental projects starting July 1st next year? That's a good question. I can give you a little bit of history behind that one. At the 2016 Council on Legislation, it was brought forward that we take a look at addressing the environment. At that time, there were five uh, different enactments uh, presented. All five failed. Um, there's a continuation that went beyond that one. Uh, Barry Rasson. Uh, was very instrumental in moving this forward, along with Ian Risley. Um, the two past presidents there were able to initiate a little bit more understanding of what that was going to be. Um, I actually met with Barry, and he talked to me about it. He goes, well, what do you think about it, Wade, being a technical coordinator? I says, it's outstanding. Look at the water projects we are doing right now. Three quarters of them plus, probably about 85, 90% of the projects we're doing now are because of polluted water. The rest of them are because of a lack of water. But if you look at polluted water as one of the issues, that's environmental. We are not controlling and protecting our environment. So he goes, huh, I get it now. So that's why we move forward with it. So when we look at environmental um, futures, what that's gonna hold for us, it's gonna be fairly broad when we come forward and we start with that one, but it's gonna be a focus that each and every municipality are now gonna have to address and uh, developing countries more so. But if you look at every country in every developed part of the world, we are facing the same issues, pollution. So that's why I think it's an important part of it. Putting this in the forefront, I think is gonna benefit a lot of us, especially as Rotarians, because now we will be in front of and being leaders in each of our communities and addressing these issues. Oh, wonderful. Richard, there was a question for you. If, uh, if this uh, seminar is, is going to be recorded and made available. Yes, uh, so the seminar, uh, webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be um, posted on the district website uh, with you know within a couple of days um, we will also send an email out to all of the attendees as as well as um, other uh, interested individuals who are unable to join us today with the link so um, everyone here will get an email if you if you gave us your email in your name in the chat um, it, with, with that link, and it will also be on the district website. I, I think this um, session is very helpful, um, very um, instructive, uh, you know, very rich session. So I would encourage 
uh, everyone to share it with your grant teams, um, with, with your club members. It, it's, it's very, very insightful. And I, I just I want to go back while it's in my mind and, you know, really kind of highlight uh, a remark that, that Wade made in the presentation. Um, again, you know, going back to community assessments. And this is, um, I can't remember which country it was, Wade, but you were talking about um, the, the a community, a farming community in a water, um, an existing um, borehole in, in, in water well that was contaminated with the fertilizer. And by going through the assessment process and, you know, who's all involved, it, it got um, a, a new well was done as it should have been, and this would have been an environmental project too, um, by, by the company, um, the, the agricultural company. So, you know, the outcome wasn't a rotary project, it was even better. It, it was, you know, it, it was actual ownership, you know, being taken. And so that, you know, we have to really think in all those, those different dimensions before we just jump into a project, it's really understanding, you know, what's what's going on on the ground with the baseline. True. Um, By the way, on on cost factor again, part of the travel, um, that app project actually was not part of my evaluation. Believe it or not, I was there to evaluate another water project. One of my friends actually called me from Rotary. Uh, he was, I think he was living in Alabama, and he goes, "Would you mind taking a look at this project we're taking a look at? We don't know what's going on with it." And it's only about an hour or so drive. So I had the Rotarians actually driving to that site. I was able to look at two other project sites doing the same thing, where I was able to assist with the planning process and procedure of a, a global grant. So uh, when we go there, <laughs> we're not just assigned specifics. We go pretty much everywhere and anywhere if we can. Yeah, excellent. We, um, I really uh, want to thank you. Uh, before we wrap up here, I appreciate your very generous sharing of your time and all your experience and knowledge with us. It's uh, really valuable and uh, uh, we appreciate it. And we look forward to working with you down the road too. Definitely so, thank you. I, I do um, see that one of our participants, our, our attendees, um, Bill Lyman, who is our um, stewardship co-chair for our grants committee had put his hand up. So I have, Bill, I have given you talking permission. I don't know if you had a question Actually, I hit the wrong key. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, no worries. But as the stewardship chair, do you do you do you have any any um, comments or questions? Uh, not a stewardship chair, but we have uh, our club Elmhurst has done a number of global grant projects, uh, and before that, really uh, matching grant projects with uh, a club in Mexico, and we really. We really stopped doing that in the last couple of years because we could not get them to understand the, uh, the importance of doing a community assessment. Um, and and I, I'm just so appreciative of this webinar because it was able to, to reinforce what I thought we were trying to accomplish with, with this aspect of, of a global grant. So. Uh, Sometimes we take, uh, we scratch our heads because we think Rotary is too nitpicky perhaps, but in, in this particular case, I think it, it generates great benefits. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Good comments. Good. I, I have one more, one more comment that I wanted to ask Wade. Wade, last week uh, when we had the conversation between you, Rachel and I, uh, one thing, one the point that we, that we touched that I want you to, to to expand now a little bit is uh, uh, the community assessment. You know, how does that tie to the final evaluation or the, or the, or the, or the grant? How how can you develop uh, uh, KPIs, uh, you know, key, key points for it for evaluating the grant based on that community assessment? So can you that would tie down the whole thing? Can you can you please elaborate a little? Yeah, bit? Yeah, definitely. Um... If you look at the written portion of the grant, global grant application, it gives you suggestions, recommendations on measurables. And that's where it shows up, not in the community assessments. However, it's through the community assessments you get the information from. Um, these measurements are, I would say, very specific. You, in other words, you wanna try and be as tight as you can with an actual number. And the only way you can get those numbers as an international partner, you can't do it yourself. It has to be done by the host 
clubs and the members of that host club. So that's where it becomes important that you create these partnerships. How do you create those partnerships? Through the community assessment tool. And you're not going to do it in writing through the grant because then it's too, I would say it's too stark. It, it, there's not enough skin in the game. Where if you do a community assessment, everybody buys into it. We take a look at the needs. We will be able to address the needs. How do we know the needs? Based on the numbers. And that's where you get the KPIs, key performance indicators. And that's where those numbers come from. At the end of it all, um, you will look to see if, in fact, your global grant has met those uh, the needs. And sometimes it is beyond that, four or five years beyond the actual finish or completion of a global grant. So how do you get those numbers? You go back to the partners. And if you don't have a good partnership with that one, you lose the number. That's, again, starts with the community assessment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions in the, there is a lot of uh, comments saying that this is an excellent presentation and, Thank you. and uh, from the audience thanking Wade for, uh, for bringing all these points and sharing his knowledge, uh, but no more specific um, uh, questions that I can see. And yeah. for the committee too, Pedro, if you like, um, you're welcome to share um, my email, stay in contact with me. Um, I am slightly overwhelmed with the three jobs I got from the foundation, but at least I have connections. We can move people around and assist you in that area. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I, I think the response uh, today that we're seeing in the chat and the questions um, about the community assessments, but as well as the, the cadre program expanding is, is probably typical of, of, of what you hear or what you would hear um, around the Rotary family around the world. So uh, we appreciate what you are doing um, very, very much, what you have done and, and, and what you will be doing to um, really help the 700 cadres, which I'm, I'm sure will be more, you know, after hearing this today, you might've inspired some people here um, to, you know, to be really active in those roles and really become, you know, integrated with the the grant planners um, in the communities. I just, I, I see so much great potential. So really, really appreciate that um, very, very much. And I, I think you'll hear lots of cheering. <laughs> as you yeah, There are a few other uh, resources if you don't mind me sharing it. Um, I have a Rotary TV show. It's called wearerotary.tv. It's just spelled out there, wearerotary.tv, where I actually highlight a lot of these trips that I um, use for the PowerPoint. And they're half hour shows. You could actually see the beginning and end, the implementation of them, the challenges and the natural feel of the project because uh, we go through a full presentation on each of these pres uh, these programs. Also, uh, I'm coming out with a book. It's called uh, Creating Destiny. And uh, it's due to be released at the first part of the year. Um, this one too, I use as a, a tool to show the model, the benefits of how Rotary projects actually can change lives. So. That's, that's great. Um, we'll inc I will include all of that in the follow-up um, communication that great. we send out. Yeah. Thanks. So I, cause we getting a lot of comment in the chats asking, asking for to be, for people to be included in, in that follow-up <laughs> communication with all you the bet. links. You so, bet. Happy to. <laughs> yeah. This, this has just absolutely um, been, been a great morning. Um, if I, I'm not hearing any other questions coming forward. Um, I don't see any either. So. Okay. Um, I'm just going to look at the chat one more time here and save it. So ag again, um, Wade and in all of our attendees, I just want to thank you all for, for being here this morning. Um, and, you know, the, the inspiration that and the learning, you know, that we're all feeling um, going forward. So uh, thank you. I will turn off the recording uh, right now. So